dad had six brothers, and they were all involved from 1940 up to, to about 85 when they, they passed away. And my dad was named as Adolf, and growing up in Browns Valley was a commercial fishing town. There were about 25 different commercial fishing groups out of Browns Valley that did this uh, commercial fishing seining. I did commercial fishing since I was 14 years old, uh, off and on for about 45 years, and, and every day was, was a joy. Commercial fishing does take place yesterday. There's a, one fellow out of Browns Valley, uh, uh, Terry Miller. He he's, lives right on my home front where I was born and reared. said like everybody else I'm never going to be a fisherman but here I am 58 and I'm a fisherman well I grew up with it my whole life never been away from it there was five fishing companies to the best of my knowledge that operated out of Browns Valley and several other smaller ones that processed fish I mean it was a booming industry here in Browns Valley in its day to the Department of Natural Resources. They wanted the underutilized species of fish, or they call them rough fish, out of their lakes. Carp and buffalo fish, suckers. After we took all the carp and, and stuff out, it made better fishing for the lake because we didn't have all those rough fish in the lake. One year down in Lac of Paro, uh, we, we caught over 15,000 pounds of 12-pound uh, walleyes, and we had to throw all those back in the lake. And we had a lot of spectators and they wonder well, what was the deal so we would say well we have to throw those back because we can't keep the, the game fish you know that's the state law you can't keep game fish we drive our equipment on the lake and then we drill a big hole and then the next thing we do we'd have to drill a bunch of holes make it like a minnow seine and it go around circle and then we'd have uh, pulley ropes and we'd have uh, augers and in the, in the, there'd be about 18 on the crew. And, and we'd put the seine in and then when we get around the lake, then we'd have to have a great big hole to bring the seine out. And what they'd have it is a great big pulley on a tractor that would pull the seine out. And, and then once we got way in the end of the seine, there'd be a live bag and that's where all the fish would be. And they could be anywhere from a half a million pounds or, or 100,000 pounds, or there could be nothing. But we usually caught a lot of fish. We seined during the summer and the winter also. Most of the fish went down to Spirit Lake, Iowa, where they processed them, and they ended up in Chicago and New York. They would flay them out, and they call them carp sandwiches or fish sandwiches. And, and they, we'd sell millions of pounds, all the different commercial fishermen from Minnesota. We used to smoke fish. Uh, Richard, my cousin, and I, we smoked 10,000 pounds of, of uh, carp every, every couple weeks, and we'd sell to High V, uh, Super Value, Red Owl stores when they, were, when they were going. Smoked carp is a delicious fish. And then there's also Browns Valley. There was a company a few years back that made fish baloney out of carp. The seining when they first started out, well, years in 1920 they used horses and wagons, and then it got a little bit better where they had cars and, and tractors. So everything has gotten quite modernized. We got little remote control submarines that pull a rope around underneath the ice that before they pushed one by fours nailed together. That's what pulled the rope around. So it's gotten, just like anything else, it's gotten modernized to help. Tractors that you see here in the background now are today's best, you know. I mean, basically everything's hydraulic compared to years ago. Everything was done literally by hand. Okay, these are a tractor here. This is called a pulling tractor. It's got a winch on the back side there for winching the rope in the wintertime. This is an auger tractor that you see. It's got a big auger here on the back that drills the holes. And that tractor follows over there, the winch tractor that pulls the sand. These boats here, my open water 
boats that I sand with in the summertime. And that's where this is. We've got two tractors of each here, another auger tractor and another winch tractor here. And uh, that concludes for the winter, besides the one outside that dips the fish. So that's the operation. Like I said, summertime, these are the boats. And I have three other boats basically we haul fish with, besides these after we catch them. Use, this is what they used to chop the whole layout or sand haul with was this right here. And now we use augers. These are just used to trim stuff up, basically. That part I don't miss right there. I'll take the hydraulics and the power takeoffs any day. No, this was uh, a great invention when they came out with that. Dave Rod designed these, another commercial fisherman uh, that we wind the net up on in the wintertime. Time to wrap her up. Whatever's laying on the bottom is going to get caught in the net. Couldn't be good, couldn't be bad, because a lot of times it tears the net up. Travers and Big Stone Lake actually had grain barges that ran up and down them. That's how they shipped the grain. And they said that's where the anchors came from that broke loose off of the barges and the boats. December 1960, we pulled a million pounds of carp from uh, Lacaparo Lake. My Uncle Joe, that's one of my dad's brother, you know, he said, we're going to have a lot of fish, everybody, and, and, and I didn't know what he meant by that. And once the sand started coming in, all these fish come in, you know, everybody was jumping around and saying, well, we, we made a big haul. The other fishermen, they weren't, we all worked together as, as commercial fish. We got along as family, but when one family caught more fish, we'd have bragging rights. So, I mean, it was kind of comical where uh, we would say, well, we caught a million pounds and this other guy said, no, that's not the truth. Well, we had pictures of it and we had records, so we'd have, we'd have a kind of a party over it. You know, we'd, we'd sing and dance and tell everybody, well, what a wonderful catch we caught today. Well, I mean, a lot of people say winters are cold, but uh, our, our fishing company, we'd have rubber gear uh, so that would make us a lot warmer that we have insulated pants, gloves. Uh, so it, it made it it made it very comfortable, but unless it got 30 below, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be out in the lake. One time I uh, fell in the, into this great big landing hole. Well, what Dad did, he took one of these ice hooks and he, and he dipped me out with this ice hook. And, and what I said, well, Dad, I can go home now. And he said, no, son, you can't. We got a pair of dry clothes in the, in the truck. We'll change and come back to work in 15 minutes. <laughs> special person to want to get wet in the summer and cold in the winter. It uh, can be very rewarding. It's like any other business and it can be um, quite stressful at other times. Back in the days I've heard stories where they dip for three days to get the fish out of the net. Nowadays our volume is not there like it used to be. There's no little fish coming back where it used to be years ago. It didn't matter where you went, the lakes were just full. And you you no more than fish them down, as we'd say, catch out the surplus. And two years later, they were just as thick as they were before. And now you don't see that anymore. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. Our whole ecosystem has changed. six left commercial fishermen left in Minnesota right at the moment, whereas there used to be about 30 of us. You know, it's kind of a dying art, but there is history to it. You know, I kind of hate to see it go down the wayside, but then I have, I have good memories. On a personal level, it'd be being with my dad and my uncles. Uh, I, got, I got, as a young fellow, I got to know life. I mean, they taught me so many things. Uh, they taught me how to be courteous and all this other things and especially Richard, my cousin. Richard was a top-notch guy. He uh, took over the fishing when my dad died, and then I got involved with Richard about look, two weeks later. We'd always be around family, and it was a family affair, so uh, we, we worked out really good. The small 
smaller life, that's what I like. This is where I was born and raised, so your roots kind of dig in a little bit. You know, I mean, there's a lot of great places. I always said I'd move, but now I'm, I guess I'm old enough where I'll probably just finish staying here. I mean, I love the outdoors, so I guess that's why I do it. And we have a good time when everybody works together. The work is not that bad. It's a great life. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 96.7cram.com. <laughs>